Hi, I'm Ryan Davis. And I'm Kiernan Schmidt. And this is Out of Office, a travel podcast. And today we're talking about restaurants, how to pick what restaurant to eat at, how to get reservations at restaurants, and how to make the most of your dining experience when on vacation. And if you, if you are dying to eat at a place that doesn't take reservations, what are some strategies for trying to get into that? Strategies or tips, or uh, I think they call them life hacks. I think uh, tricks of the trade is another yeah. way. <laughs> tricks of the travel trade. Maybe we could tricks of the travel trademark. Trade. We can trademark that right now. Trademark. We'll use that in the future. <laughs> tricks of the travel trade. It, it, that might actually be a better tagline than anything I'm presenting to you today. Oh, that's right. So uh, you are referencing. We still don't have tagline for this show. We have mm -hmm. uh, out of right. office a travel podcast nothing it feels like you need a little something i pitched you some humdingers and uh you've rejected them all thus far so this week i want to hear uh what you came up with yeah so i have put a lot of time into this i, I came up with 1076 unique slogans and some of them are fantastic and you thought you thought of all these well i i thought about using the shopify slogan generator and I typed in out of office, and then I got all these great slogans. Why are you, you always take the shortcut, Ryan? Well, you know, sometimes you gotta, you gotta put in the effort. This is idea to, generating time. This is, this is not, you know, these might, might give us an idea that, that we'll build on. I don't think these are gonna be the final ones, but I'm telling you, there's some really high quality ones. Do you know how many hours it took me to come up with ding, ding, ding goes the trolley? <laughs> Sadly, I do. You were, <laughs> you were texting me about it as you were, you know, coming up with each, each line. I had to take several days off just, just to come up, just to really focus in on that one. All right, you don't feel, all right, let's get to it. So you have how many? Out of the thousand, why don't you pick two or three? I don't think we have yeah, time to go through all of them. 1,076. Sure. Okay. All right, the first one. All right. Nobody better lay a finger on my out of office. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, I recognize it. It's from uh, Bart Simpson. Butterfinger ads. Well, it's 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 nostalgic, right? It's like people are like, oh, oh, what is that? Oh, reference? are we talking like, about oh. traveling twenty years ago? <laughs> also, it would have to be like nobody better lay a office on my <laughs> out of office. I no, I don't like it. But no. I tell you what, how about this? Right. If you can get the Simpsons voices doing that, I'll I'll agree to it. The Bart voice, I could probably do that. It doesn't even need to be the Bart voice. I'll even make it easier for you. It could okay. be a tier two character. It could be Apu. Well, I don't think we can unpack Apu on this, on this episode. <laughs> <laughs> have you seen that documentary? I, I didn't see that. I have not seen it yet. I, I definitely want to see it, though. Absolutely. All right. Rejected. Move on. Number two. Feel the magic of out of office. Feel the magic of out of office you know you don't always have to put out of office in it it seems like maybe in what you used you put because it's going to go out of office a travel podcast yeah. feel the magic of out of office see how it, it feels like maybe it's too much and if i asked you i do yeah it's a little it's a little late because I've, 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 I've made all these um, to define out of the office, magic though. that we're feeling here on the third episode what how would you say that magic is what is the magic of it i mean i think the magic of travel you know exploring new cultures new food you know, that's the magic that we're talking about. I'd say it's the theme song. I find that theme song very magical. The theme song by Joe Dramala. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we want to thank Joe Dramala for, 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 for contributing this uh, uh, theme song. Joe's a... Uh, Can we say it together? Like, thank you. Like when a teacher comes into a classroom and everyone says hello. Okay. All right. Thank you, Thank Joe. you. That wasn't... Yeah, that wasn't very good. No, it wasn't totally right. No. But uh, check out JoeDramala.com. We'll put a link in the show notes. And what's he, what else has he done? Maybe you could get, toss yeah, him a he, bone here. Sure. I mean, he writes musical theater. In fact, we worked together on quite a few musicals back when I uh, was in the musical theater business. and The old musical theater game? The old musical theater game. Uh, and he was, I think I saw you. You played Annie, right? When I was a kid on Broadway? No, no. I was, uh, it was Phantom of the Opera. Yeah, thank oh, you. all right. Yeah. All right. And was yeah. this when you were a country star? <laughs> oh, that's a uh, callback for all you loyal <laughs> listeners. All right, let's get down to that third tagline. This one's going to be the winner. So uh, it's your last shot for this week. Please, please pick a good one. 
Okay, and so I've I took your feedback mm. and I I said, all right, let's throw out the word out yeah. of office. Let's bring in the word travel. And so I've come up with one thousand and seventy six slogans containing the word travel. Oh, is that the same number? <laughs> the exact same number. Good golly. Um, so I I think you're gonna really really like this one. I'm ready to. Okay. Be young, have fun, drink, travel. Like just you know, it's like drinking life. It's like. You're guzzling down the travel juice. I have to admit, I don't recognize what brand that's ripped off from. Do you? Do you know? <laughs> I, I don't know. I think it's, I think that I came up with it on my own. But I think drink travel is really idiotic. And I also don't like be young because neither of us are spring chickens. And, you know, I think a lot of people uh, don't have enough disposable income to travel until they're older. That's uh, true. So I find that one very alienating, very ageist. And uh, it seems to promote unhealthy drinking habits. <laughs> All right. Well, then we'll, we'll, we'll toss that aside. And you, you should come back with some better ones next week. All right. I'll add that to my ever-growing to-do list of uh, things you're not taking care of. Okay. Um, now, Ryan, we would usually jump uh, right to the cabin crew here. Um, but I actually have a correction that I want to make. correction? It's more context than a correction of something okay. we talked about last time. So why don't we head on over to recalculating. Let's do it. Recalculating. All right. We're going we're gonna to call it recalculating whenever we're revisiting a topic, whether to correct or to, to give extra details on from a previous episode. So what we're recalculating today is uh, we were discussing Disney World, and uh, we were talking about alcohol being served within Disney World. And I had asserted that I thought I had recently heard that uh, they were serving for the first time in the Magic Kingdom. Not so. A as it happens, alcohol just sloshing all over the place in Disney World uh, and entered the Magic Kingdom in 2012 when they opened up a uh, Beauty and the Beast-themed restaurant. Do you know what that restaurant was called, Ryan? Be your guest? 100%. You've got, I've always said you could be an Imagineer. <laughs> um, so what, what the news actually was, was that for the first time, they're going to serve alcohol in Disneyland. Disneyland in California. And, and those are different things. But the most important part is that it's only going to be in the new Star Wars part of the park. Oh, that's right, because Star Wars is a Disney brand now. It's, yeah, now it's just, it's lost all its soul. I'm a huge Star Wars geek, as, as you know. And uh, so they're, they're coming up with a Star Wars, um, Star Wars park. It's going to be called Galaxy's Edge. There's going to be a bar, a cantina in it, because you got to have a cantina, had to have it be Star Wars called Aga's Cantina, and uh, they're going to be serving booze there. And it's the first time, because uh, apparently when the, ever since 1955, uh, Disney always said he wanted it to represent family values, and that's why they've kept alcohol out of the park. And, and now alcohol is really a part of the American family. Absol absolutely. I mean, under this presidency, am I right? <laughs> you know, maybe they, uh, once they legalize marijuana in California, they could open up a Puff the Magic Dragon sort of exhibit there. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, not Puff the Magic Dragon. Pete's Dragon, I think, is probably Pete's, what oh, have. Pete's Dragon, right? Yeah, Pete's Dragon. Yeah, yeah, whose name yeah. is Elliot. Pete. Nice. Uh, oh, it's not, it's, not, it's not Puff? No, it's Elliot. Uh, or is Elliot the boy? No, I'm pretty sure. So, all right, we'll have to do a recalculating on this fact. <laughs> um, so, uh, again, if you, if you want to raise a glass in Disney World, you want to, uh, you know, toast a Rodian, you want to knock up an Ewok, uh, you're going to be able to real soon. But uh, at the Magic Kingdom, you can get sloshed right now. One more reason to go, or one reason to go. <laughs> <laughs> Are we ready to take off? Again, yeah, all right. Tell the cabin crew. It's time. Flight attendants, prepare for takeoff, please. Today we're talking about uh, restaurants, and one of the first things you have to do is figure out where to eat. So, uh, you know, usually I plan, like, a big meal or two for, for the weekend, and try to leave space in between for things like street food, small local lunches, breakfast, things like that. Um, so you're not booking all three meals every day that that you're uh, no. I'm booking probably just two two big meals uh, ahead of time, like at the at the restaurants that I know that I want to go to when I when I head to a city. Yeah, and then I will often let breakfast live within the hotel because uh, that that way you could just get out sightseeing fast, and it's it's easy uh, to just consume whatever the hotel gives you for free. Well, I, I, have, I have always wondered what kinds of people eat in a hotel, and now I know. What, do you actually, do you go out for breakfast? Well, I mean, I, you know, I, I mean, when I'm on vacation, I'm waking up at noon, so, you know, I don't know that I'm having breakfast, but I, I Again, definitely. 
this is why we don't travel together. <laughs> no. My, um, schedule, my itinerary starts at 6 a.m. I bet it does. Yeah, yeah. So the, the, the thing you have to realize is never go on TripAdvisor or Yelp for restaurants because it is, it is probably the worst place to go to find out where you should actually eat. So if you consider going on TripAdvisor or Yelp, you're going to you know, end up at, at the Olive Garden in, you know, in Milan, not where you want to be. So you're basically saying uh, Yelp and TripAdvisor are populated by kind of everyone that arrives on a giant cruise ship. Yeah, pretty much. So it's just it's just some you know the folks who are the biggest restaurants you know make those lists, not necessarily the best ones, and probably the biggest Americans who are writing the reviews. Right, exactly. So the biggest Americans, like size wise. <laughs> <laughs> Or just that's, like the that's most actually, American. That's that's not what I meant, Ryan. Yeah, I think I that's really sizest of you. <laughs> so I am into Eater, uh, Zagat, the New York Times, and uh, Michelin as places I go to actually find these restaurants. It's not Zagat? Like like Bob Zagat? I think it's Zagat, but it might be Zagat. We're going to have to have a recalculating next yeah, week. Yeah, I don't uh, No, yeah. no, we're not going to do that. <laughs> we're gonna, <laughs> people can Google it. <laughs> How about Michelin? You don't do Michelin? No, I said Michelin. Michelin's great. Okay, so you Eater's know, a guy. You know why? why? You know why Michelin is called Michelin? Yeah, because uh, it was a marketing scheme. Everybody had just gotten their, their uh, Model Ts, and they were strapping the Michelin tires on, and they wanted people uh, to have destinations that they had to drive to to wear out their tires. Exactly. So these are destinations worth driving to. <laughs> so they, they only <laughs> reviewed restaurants that were thousands of miles away from where you live. So the uh, New York Times has the 36-hour uh, features, what, you know, which outline like places to go in a city if you have 36 hours. They always have some really good top-line restaurants to, to check out. And I've noticed the, uh, the food, uh, the food uh, section of the New York Times is also spending more time on international than they used to. It used to be very cooking and recipe and New York restaurant heavy, but now they're really sewing in spotlights on international restaurants uh, that that maybe don't even cross over to that travel section. Oh yeah, and and I think there's like a, I mean, there's like a food revolution happening all around the the world. Though the amount of fantastic restaurants in small cities and out of the way places, I think, has just increased. And uh, you know, there's probably just more more to write about. Eater, Eater is great because it's, it's constantly updated. They have a ton of content, and they usually hit most of the big cities. So every six to eight months, they'll like uh, do another 50 restaurants in a major city. So it's a great way to sort of see what's happening right now. Do they always do 38 restaurants? I feel like that's their thing. It's like 38 restaurants that you have to try at this place. They do a lot of 38 restaurants, but they also like mix it up. Some cities don't have, you know, it's like 38 restaurants in Cleveland, <laughs> you know, not, not a category. <laughs> I uh, I feel like I've seen the number 17, too. It seems like they avoid nice round numbers. They don't like 10s. Maybe that's like an SEO thing. Yeah. <laughs> What's SEO, Ryan? Search engine optimization. Oh, a marketing hack. Yeah. Uh, and, <laughs> okay, I will say it surprised me when you said Zagat, because I, I think of those as sort of, they're those like long, thin, weird books that don't fit in my bookshelves, yeah. right? Right. Yeah, but they, they've like you know they've made it work on the web. You know they've they've and they've entered two thousand and three, and they got themselves a nice a nice website, and and there's definitely stuff on there. Um, and that only works in the, I think the bigger cities. Uh, not not every city has a Zagat guide, and also like Michelin doesn't go into too much Eastern Europe. So you know when you're in like Bratislava, there's no there's no uh, Michelin star restaurants there. Have you been to Bratislava? I have been to Bratislava. Oh wow. Never yeah. cease to amaze me. All right, so I think what you're basically saying is, uh, 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 go to places where you know a critical tongue has tasted the food. Exactly. And it's not just the power of the number of people that have given them stars. Right, right. So say one last time, the four sources you love are? Eater, Zagat, The New York Times, and Michelin. Fantastic. And now comes the hard part, the actual making of the reservations. So if you live in New York, life is really easy. You've got uh, Open Table and Resi, right? You can Everybody just, know that's what people associate with yeah. living in New York: ease, ease of e living. Yeah, you can you can go, you can book on your phone. You know, it's super simple. Um, unfortunately, Open Table and Resi are not universal apps. So in every place you go, you're not going to have access to to one of these apps. So you have to really, um, you know, put a little effort in. To, to make these reservations. I mean, I feel like that's, that's easy when you, when you can assume most people speak English, but it's uh, very hard when you don't speak the language. 
Yeah, it's it's really difficult. And so uh, often I'll do I'll try email first because email is the easiest to to you know way to contact a restaurant without having to worry about not being able to speak the language. Oh, yeah. If I've tried it on the phone a few times, it's always an absolute disaster. Yeah, it's always a disaster. Some of the more like fancier restaurants are going to have a, a host who speaks English in a lot of in a lot of cities, but you, you can't I know, rely but on then that. they pick up the phone and you don't want to be the American who just says hello right away. You yeah. feel like you got to start with hola. Yeah. And if you've really practiced it, it's really say, embarrassing if you're in France and you say hola. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you say hola so convincingly that they think that it's someone who speaks Spanish on the other side of the right. room. And then you launch into English and it totally throws them off. And then they try, they try to switch gears and then it's just a disaster. Yeah. So email is best. I mean, I, I definitely think, and you can even email, you know, send it in English and then underneath translate it into whatever language using like Google Translator or something. What are they, and what are they using in Bratislava? God, I mean, I ate at the, I ate at this restaurant in Bratislava that looks like a UFO <laughs> that that is like on the top. It's like massive. It's the tallest building in Bratislava, and uh, yeah, it's like a fancy UFO themed restaurant. All right, so I noticed you didn't answer my question about <laughs> what language are they speaking in Bratislava. So how do yeah. I book a reservation at the U- the tallest UFO in all the land? Yeah, I just showed up. I don't think you needed a reservation there. <laughs> so now it seems like maybe you don't know what language. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're speaking Czech, right? I would imagine. I don't know. I yeah. haven't been to Bratislava. Yeah. I don't think they s- speak Slovakian. I don't think okay, that's a language. Bratisla- Bratislavian. <laughs> Bratislavian. Yeah. It might be, though. I, we're gonna, that's gonna, I'm going to you know, have to do another recalculating about that. Next week. So when you do the email, you have, you know, what, the date and the subject line, then you're putting in English your request, and then you're Google translating below that. Is that right? Right. Into, yeah. okay. Into Czech. So and probably best to give them a few options just in case, because if you're trying to make a reservation, probably a hard place to get into. I definitely send multiple dates that I can go. And what I'll do is I'll make requests of more restaurants than I need, just because I know some of them will not come through. Um, so I'll, I'll request a few different restaurants and then, and then typically like half of them will get back to me. So sometimes you just can't, you know, sometimes it's just hard to reach someone uh, through email or through, or through the phone. I also think that this is uh, one of the best places to bring uh, the expert into the field, which is to say the hotel you're staying at. Because uh, the concierge, the concierge. if you're staying at a fancy place, like, a, you know, you immediately sit concierge. So you must be staying at really fancy places. Make, <laughs> even just the front desk person. Usually if you ask these hotels, hey, I really want to get into this place. Could you pick up the phone? Could you email on my behalf? They will, they will set it up even before you've gotten there. Right, exactly. So I would say the, the power of the concierge can get you into that restaurant. Yeah, when I, I went to Bogota, I showed up with a list of restaurants and like handed it to the concierge. And then we we worked through it each day. He was like, I think you can get into this place on Wednesday and this place on Tuesday. He was very impressed with the research that I had done. Um, oh. we, we managed to hit most of the places we, we wanted. That's good. So it's convert the concierge to a co-conspirator. Right. And then remember to tip. And then remember to tip. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> right. Reward yeah. him for the co-conspiratoring. Exactly. And one thing I'll stress is be really careful with time zones. Um, often if you're, uh, these, these uh, restaurants will have some kind of a weird kind of outdated reservation uh, system that you can make a reservation on their website. Uh, it's not very clear what, what time that you're making the reservation. So just double check to make sure that it's in, it's typically in the local time of the restaurant. But sometimes if you're on open table Mexico or open table Europe, it, the, it's not clear where the, what time you're making reservation until it actually shows up in your, in your email. So just you know, double check that. This is another great place to print out a piece of paper. <laughs> if, if it's written on a piece of paper, you show up at that restaurant, they will get you a seat, I guarantee you. But if oh, you show totally. it on your phone, they will reject it absolutely. There's something about that paper. So you all know uh, Hyper Planner before I get to a place. So I, I like to have all the reservations locked down, but but, you know, sometimes there's places you want to go. They either don't take reservations or they require that you book like months and months in advance, like before you even were thinking or dreaming of going to the place. So I have a couple strategies I like to employ that uh, I have successfully executed. Um, the first is once you are on the ground in the place, go in person and be extremely nice and uh, beg for everything you have with everything you have. 
to please get in, whether today, tomorrow, the next day. I will come at 2 a.m. if you'll still cook for me. I will sit at the bar. I will sit in the bathroom. I will use a child seat. Please, I'm desperate to come. I've read so much about you. I'm your biggest fan. I would write such a great review online. Flattery is super important here. Exactly, exactly. Yes. They, you got to flatter the host. Yeah, they really suck up. And I was in, uh, I was in Cardiff, and uh, I wanted to get into this restaurant really badly, and they would not let me in. The, the host just sort of like flat out refused. He said, I'm sorry, we're, we're fully committed for the next three days. You cannot get in. So I walk out, and I tweeted, you know, I wish I could get into at this restaurant. And within 20 minutes, uh, they slid into my DMs and said, how's 7 o'clock tomorrow, you know? Um, so I, I, I got in because of Twitter. <laughs> now, I have to tell you, the host, when he saw no, me. But for what it's worth, you have a huge you know, Twitter you know, following. Looks can be deceiving. So, uh, you know, I, yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> Most of those bots made you look very legitimate. Yeah, exactly. Um, but the next day when I went in, the host was not happy to see me. He, he sat me very, you know, br- briskly. He was not, a, not in a... Uh, good mood. Brusquely. Probably brusquely. I mean, t- if he said you brusquely, all the better. You could get right to ordering. <laughs> brisquely and brusquely. Yeah. yeah. Brisquely and brusquely. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Say Cheshire. Um, and <laughs> I also recommend uh, to go at an off hour. If you do a little research about what time people are typically eating in the place, uh, the place you are, then you can go at a time that they are probably unpopular. I used this recently for work. I was in Paris. Um, I had read a New York Times article uh, based on Ryan's suggestion uh, at a little place started by a Michelin star chef. See, I'm bringing in two of your favorite sources. And it was called Beta, B-A-I-E-T-A, which sounds, I don't know, I don't know how the French would pronounce that, but I said it uh, probably how they would in Spain. Uh, And it means little kiss, (laughs) uh, which I think is really cute. And uh, I, knowing that most French people don't go out to dinner until like 9 p.m., I showed up at like 6.45 and uh, begged to get in. And uh, they originally said, no, we have no room. Even though I could see in the dining room, there were tons of tables empty. And I said, are those for like 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock reservations? They said, yes. I said, I can be in and out, three courses. I will order a bottle of rosé, and I will be out in 45 minutes. I, I, I'm going to eat so <laughs> fast, it's going to disgust you. <laughs> and I think, you know, it worked out for the best. Yeah, and you, uh, you, they, you, they, you walked around Paris the rest of the night finishing your bottle of rosé. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I just had them put, them all, put all the courses right into one blender, and yeah. then a, a giant to-go cup I had brought. I, 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 I will show up the, when, right when the restaurant opens. So if it opens at like 6 o'clock, you mm. get there at six. That re- it, you can definitely just sort of walk in and and, and use your strategy of I'll be out of here by by seven seven thirty mm. because yeah you're right like there's always that hour where they're, where they're opening and things are just not uh, full yet. I also think um, this is another place where the uh, tricks of the travel trade. If you convert your concierge to a co-conspirator, if it's a fancy restaurant that's all booked out. A good hotel name can de- can sometimes get you in. They hold reservations for hotels. Uh, also, sometimes credit cards. I think. Yeah, the American Express card. Uh, they they will get you into a, a few restaurants if if you call them. Uh, certainly in like London or, or or major cities like that. And the great thing is, even if you don't have a great credit card, say that you're not one of these uh, fancy Amex members. Ryan's referring to. If you just find a, your friend who probably has the best credit rating, maybe the, the friend who has the best job, go ask that person to call and make a reservation on your behalf through the Amex concierge, and you can just walk in and say you are that person. And that's a great way to, to, to just screw the establishment, screw Amex concierge. You know, they think they can keep out the people. I'm a man of the people, all right? I want to get into that restaurant, and I'm going to use my wealthiest friend to, to sneak in. Now that, that's not going to work if you it's like Meryl Streep's credit card, you know. Like if you walked in, you're like, "Hi, table for two from Meryl Streep." <laughs> they would be like, "Where is Meryl?" You're like, yeah, uh, "They'd be like, uh, Mamma Mia." We don't think that's you. <laughs> oh, that is the worst. Uh, I think <laughs> I really apologize for that. I I think it's time for the last stop. Yeah, it, it's feeling like last stop. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is the last stop on this train. Everyone, please leave the train. All right, the last stop. This is uh, my personal favorite segment where Ryan and I each take a turn to discuss what's, uh, what's getting us excited for travel this week, even if we're you know, stuck at home. What's the next trip we're planning? What's something we've read or seen to feed that wonderlust? 
So Ryan, have you done anything interesting, read, seen anything interesting? So I went on a candlelight tour of the catacombs underneath St. Patrick's Old Cathedral in downtown Manhattan. Okay. So not the, not the beautiful, big, iconic Fifth Avenue. No, not the St. Patrick's Cathedral. St. Patrick's Old Cathedral. And this is sort of down in, in NoHo, uh, north, of, north of Houston. Um, no, nobody uses <laughs> NoHo. Come on. That's not a thing. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful old church. It was actually the, uh, the most important Catholic church in the city prior to the construction of St. Patrick's New Cathedral in Midtown. Mm-hmm. And uh, they've just opened these, uh, the catacombs underneath, and they allow you to sort of walk around, and there's a bunch of sort of famous uh, New Yorkers. Catacombs are like where, uh, it's like a crypt? Yeah, it's like a crypt. Catacombs are a crypt underneath a church. Okay, all right. Yeah. But um, because we live in New York and not in like Paris, the the catacombs are uh, kind of shiny <laughs> and clean, which isn't really what you want in a catacomb. Like what I'm looking for in a catacomb is to be frightened. Yeah, <laughs> um, especially and by also candlelight. They, yeah, so it's they say it's by candlelight, but because we uh, New York must have such strict like fire regulations, the candles are fake. They're like oh, little candles. Brother, in the wait, hold on. It's, so they're yeah. calling this a candlelight tour. I'm expecting dusty, maybe scattered bones around. Kind of like yeah, bare cement. You're, you're, you're describing a, a battery-powered <laughs> candle on like a children's playset. Yeah, and they tell us, uh, unsarcastically they told us, uh, to keep it as a souvenir. <laughs> Did you keep it? <laughs> I did not keep it, no. I didn't. I actually really hate in Catholic churches. You know how they usually have a, a, you know, a statue of a saint and you can light a candle in front of it to have your prayers kind of rise up with the smoke? Of course. A lot of those places are replacing it. You like put a, it's like a, 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 like a pinball machine. You put a quarter in a thing and a battery-powered light sparks up in front of the saint. There's no <laughs> prayers getting to that heaven is, on, on a little battery no, power. That is, no, that is so disappointing. You know, the Catholic no, Church. You need to look, if, yeah. if, if, if there's one thing wrong with the Catholic Church, it's the fact that they are using battery-powered <laughs> candles. So this particular Catholic Church, St. Patrick's Old Cathedral, like I said, has these crypts. They're kind of interesting. For me, the best part of the tour was when we went out of the crypts into the church and uh, the mm. tour guide explained to us that this was actually the church um, that Martin Scorsese went to when he was a kid, and he wanted to be a- before he died and got interred in the uh, catacombs. Uh, Martin Scorsese is not dead. He's a great. Oh, oh all right. <laughs> he's a, sorry. He's a great. Just trying to make this sound a little cool. <laughs> yeah, he's a great. He's a great filmmaker. He's alive and well. Um, and it's actually the church that they filmed the famous baptism scene in uh, from The Godfather. Mm, which Godfather? The first Godfather. Uh, and is that a Scorsese film? No, that's by Francis Ford Coppola. Oh, all right. Just, wow. Just, just testing. Yeah, yeah. Folks, he's not a film major. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Say it again. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, I would recommend the Catacombs tour if you're somebody who enjoys churches and uh, wants to hear more about, like, the local history of New York because there are some good New York connections. And, and It sounds... It sounds like you really recommend the church more than the catacombs, though. Yeah, and you can go to the church without spending the twenty dollars to do the tour. So maybe they should just go to mass. I don't. Is that a thing they open the church for? Uh, Ryan, <laughs> <laughs> you did grow up what? this way. That's uh, true. It's true. What What is your last stop, Kiernan? No, let's All do right. it. My uh, last stop this week is I was uh, I was taking a cab in New York uh, last week. And I had this like a, like a like a yellow cab, like a yellow cab. Yeah. Wow. It's because I was in a, a great rush to get to LaGuardia, and uh, I didn't have time to wait for an Uber and a Lyft. And there was a guy who just pulled right in front of me, and I just said, and you, you, "You just held it. You just stuck your hand." I just down held just it. Like, it was real old time in New York. Whistle? No, I didn't did you do have the whistle? a whistle, but I could have oh, whistled. Okay. So uh, yeah. I begged the guy to take me to LaGuardia. He he did. We had a long ride together, like oh, well over an hour together. And this guy, a yeah. young guy, really talkative, and his name was Diego. And uh, I, I, Diego just fed my wanderlust in a big way because Diego is an immigrant from Ecuador. And uh, first of all, he told me that as a New York City uh, taxi driver, guess how much he makes a year? I mean, I've read stories that it, it, does, it seems like it's, it's rough. It's been on a decline, right? He makes $50,000 a year. 
Not I mean, bad. That's a lot of hours, probably. It is a lot of hours. He and yeah. he he only takes one day off a week. But anyway, I lo- I really liked him. And so I said to him, "Are you planning on staying in New York permanently?" He said, oh, "Absolutely not. I am saving up <laughs> to move back to Ecuador to open a seven room B and B on the beach. Seven room. A seven room. He very specifically knew it was going to be a seven room B and B on the beach." Um, and so I said to him, "Oh, you're going to have to you're going to have to tell me where this is coming." He said, "It's an undiscovered place." It's uh, it's on the beach, and I said, okay, how do you get to it? And he said, well, you have to fly to Quito, and then you have to drive like five hours. And I shook my head as if that won't, uh, that you know, that that B and B is going to be uh, booked out for a long time. And uh, it's it's at a place called Mompiche, Mompiche, M O M P I C H E. And I looked it up later. I will say, it looks fantastic. Like, I love this guy's idea of going home and building a B&B here. He said that to buy the space to build it, $15,000. $15,000. Yeah. (laughs) So so you could see where maybe New York doesn't seem competitive to living on the beach for $15,000. Yeah, for fifteen thousand dollars in New York, you can you can I mean you can't even buy you can't buy anything for fifteen thousand. <laughs> I was trying to come up with what, uh, like a joke, yeah. and I'm like, I could take this up. Wait, well, not actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, I luckily, and so I asked him tons of questions about Ecuadorian culture and you know what he loves, what he hates, and uh, I said, do you have a dish? Speaking to restaurants, we're talking about today. What is kind of the Ecuadorian dish that when I go to Ecuador I have to eat? And he immediately said, guinea pig. And I think he fully expected me to be like, eh, guinea pig, those are pets. But instead, I got to be like, oh, yeah, I was just in Peru in June. I, I ate some guinea pig. How was it? Let me tell you. It, you know, it was okay. I mean, it was fun. I, you know, it, it doesn't turn me off uh, foods that we're not used to. Plus, I never had a guinea pig as a pet. If you asked me to eat a hamster, I feel like it'd be a little more difficult for me. I, I ate a, a horse in in Montreal. <laughs> the whole thing. Not the whole, not the whole thing. No, <laughs> no, just a, a nice bit of horse tartare. I feel like that saddle would really get stuck in the throat. <laughs> um, but what was nice was I could play it as if you know, oh no, guinea pig. That's just a thing I eat every yeah. day. And he was very, very impressed. That's when he really started to open up to me. Yeah, I've, I've never had this long of a conversation with with a cab driver. It's a very David Brooks kind of story you're telling here. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> That's true. Well, I no, you know what? I was in a mood. I was trying to distract myself from how close I was cutting it to making the flight. And so uh, he really, he really, I, I, if, if it's a nice person who, who likes talking about their own country, I will happily engage and learn. And I was taking mental notes. Mompiche is now on my list. And if I give this five years before I get to Ecuador, uh, I'm going to look up his b and I will say, though, I did ask him what it was going to be called. And his answer was sensuality. Really? <laughs> yeah, I don't. That part was less clear to me. Um, and he kind of gave me a look in the rearview mirror that I just thought, oh, okay, maybe I got to spend some time on my phone now. But <laughs> I will be looking at sensuality in because uh, I would love to walk in there to a beautiful little Airbnb, not Airbnb, little b and I'm sure I could book it through Airbnb and say, hey, you were my cab driver five years ago, Diego. And I talked about you on my podcast that has become my media empire. <laughs> well, I look forward to that day. Amen. All right, Ryan. Well, that is, wraps it up for this week. What are we talking about next time? We are going to talk about some of our favorite historical homes to visit in the United oh, States. Historical homes. I got a lot of thoughts. Oh, you do. So until next week, I'm Ryan Davis. And I'm Kiernan Schmidt. And we are out of office.